I'll be in Psalm chapter number 138. This is where we'll find our place of reading this morning. And I know our congregation is down in size a little bit today. Uh, I say a little bit. I probably should say a lot of bit. And, but nevertheless, I'm thankful to be here and I'm glad that you are. And I uh, pray that God would help us in the matter of attendance. And uh, that he would just burden our hearts to be faithful uh, to the house of the Lord. And, um, you know, if, we, uh, if we're going to have a church, we're going to have to faithfully attend it. And if we don't attend, we won't have a church. And uh, that's about all I know how to say about it. We, we, we either come or we won't come. I can't make anybody come. can't give you the desire to come, but... I pray the Lord to give you desire to come. And uh, Psalm chapter number 138. And we'll read that entire chapter. And it's eight verses in length. And I trust by now that uh, you have enjoyed reading through the book of Psalms. If you're staying right with us in the reading, you have just about completed reading through the longest book of the Bible. And I say it's a great blessing. And we find prayer and praise throughout uh, this book of Psalm. And so Psalm chapter 138, if you found your place, would you say amen? amen. Let's stand together and uh, reverence the Word of God, eight verses of Scripture, and I'll share with you what God has given to me. The Bible said, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. In the day when I cried, thou answeredest me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, Yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we're th thankful for this opportunity to stand in your blessed uh, uh, holy pulpit and, and to preach and to proclaim your word. And Lord, I know that no doubt all across the land and country today on this, uh, on this first day of the week, uh, God, this Sunday, your day, that men are standing in many places and proclaiming the truth of your word. I pray you'd help us here today at Liberty Baptist Father, to grow in your grace and your knowledge. I pray, Father, that you would uh, help us to hear from heaven. God, may, I pray you'd make the preaching easy. God, uh, overcome our infirmities and our inabilities. And we'll be careful to give you praise, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Uh, I want to preach on this thought, and we will take our thought from verse number 7. I want to preach on this thought, personal revival in the midst of trouble. Personal revival in the midst of trouble. Do you notice there in the first part of that uh, verse, in verse 7, David writing says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me, thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. We don't know the specific occasion of this writing. Uh, uh, it appears that David is under affliction and some type of persecution. Uh, uh, he's, uh, uh, he's come under the uh, per, uh, persecution of his enemies. Uh, and David appeals to God uh, in this writing. Uh, and I don't know that we could say uh, particularly what the particular circumstance uh, might be. But this much we do know today. Uh, David was seeking God's help 
in the time of trouble. Uh, David was seeking the Lord uh, in time of trouble. And you say, preacher, uh, how do you know that? Well, uh, we can read about it in verse number 3 uh, and verse number 7. Do you notice what he said in verse number 3? Uh, he said, in the day when I cried, thou answerest me. In verse 7, he said, though I walk in the midst of trouble... Thou wilt revive me. As I begin to think about revival in the midst of trouble, uh, personal revival, because David wasn't seeking revival here in this instance uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, his kingdom, as it will, for, for Israel, uh, but he was seeking personal revival. He was seeking the Lord's help uh, in his time of need. Uh, when I look at this scripture, my friend, uh, and I think about what David is praying, uh, and what is going on here, it reminds me uh, that you and I, uh, that believers can have confidence in God uh, for what He has done uh, and what He is doing and what He will do. Now I know that we're living in troublesome times. Uh, and so uh, we can have confidence in God. Uh, and so this, when we look at this scripture, it provides us hope in the time of trial. I, I mean, there's hope here in this scripture. And glory, hallelujah. And, and every person, myself, you, every Christian, I ought to strive for personal revival. It ought to be our desire to have revival, to, to walk closer with the Lord, to, to be less like me and more like Him. And I thought about that, and I thought about, we're all familiar with the prince of preachers, that famous a preacher of days gone by by the name of Charles Spurgeon uh, uh, who pastored in London there uh, at the New Park Street Chapel uh, among other places. Uh, uh, but what we do not know uh, was that there was a man that was a predecessor to Charles Spurgeon uh, who in his day was just as popular as Brother Spurgeon. And uh, James A. Smith had this to write. And I begin to think about this quote from him uh, uh, when I look at the striving for personal revival. James Smith, the predecessor to Spurgeon, said it like this. He said, my object, my goal, my aim, my desire. He says that uh, my, my object uh, is to take my mind uh, off self and put it on the Savior. He said it's to take uh, my mind from sin uh, and put it on salvation. Uh, he said it's to take my mind from the troubles uh, and the afflictions of this world uh, and put it on the comfort that's found in God's holy word. You say, what was he saying? He was desiring a closer walk with the Lord. Uh, I, I mean, he was striving for personal revival. May I say today that you can have revival if nobody else does. Uh, hey, listen, I, I mean, uh, if nobody else desires to have a walk with the Lord, uh, you can walk with the Lord. Uh, hey, if everybody else is determined uh, to go the way of the world, uh, you can still uh, follow after the Lord. Uh, if everybody else is bound and determined to forsake uh, uh, God's Word, uh, uh, you can still follow after God's Word. Uh, and David was seeking help in time of trouble. Have you ever experienced troubles? Have you ever had a problem in your life? Have you ever encountered a problem that you thought could not be overcome? That it could not be conquered? My friend, God is the master of every circumstance. And I look at this this morning, and there's so much more in this eight verses of scripture that I could preach on in a lifetime, but I see three very basic things about this personal revival in this chapter. I see, first of all, Brother Oida, I see the position of revival. It's given to us right here in God's Word. The position of God's Word. Hey, listen, do you know the revival is not based on your physical ability? Revival is not based on your financial successes. Uh, revival is not based on your popularity uh, uh, or, the, or the office that you hold uh, in your local church. Uh, but revival uh, uh, is a matter of the heart. 
Revival is a matter of the heart. And David here in his writing, Brother Jerry lets us know that when he sought God in the time of his trouble, uh, that it was a matter of the heart. Uh, a lot of people have a heart problem. and But the Bible tells us here in verse 1, what's he say? I will praise thee, what? With my finances. I will praise thee with my ability. I will praise thee with my kingship. He said, no, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Hey, listen, David laid no claims on himself. He had abandoned ego and he had abandoned self and he had no claims on self and he had given it all to God. My friend, oh, listen, I, I've said this down here at the church uh, uh, many different, on many occasions. Uh, God will not accept a divided heart. Let, let me say it like this. You can't serve both God and mammon. Uh, you can't live with one foot in the church uh, and one foot in the world. Uh, hey, you can't be a friend to Caesar uh, and be a friend to God. Uh, hey, listen, if you're going to serve God uh, and have revival and fellowship with God, uh, uh, you're going to have to approach God uh, and give Him your whole heart. When Joni and I got married, 30 uh, 37 years ago, uh, uh, this uh, December, uh, uh, when, we, uh, when I got married, I, uh, on that day, and uh, uh, we formalized what we had already done uh, a long time before that. We gave each other our whole heart. Uh, hey, listen, I, I wasn't in love with Joni uh, and some other people down the road. Uh, I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't in love with Joni and the things uh, uh, that uh, attracted me in this world, my hobbies and interests. Uh, I had given myself to her and I was devoted to her and my friend were devoted as uh, the bride of Christ to our Savior. Amen. And so uh, David here in his declaration of praise he said I will praise thee. He, he, it's a declaration of praise. Uh, uh, David assures us here in this writing that he did not have a divided heart. Uh, he, he, was not un, he was not divided in his loyalty to the Lord. Uh, he, he had given it all to the Lord. He, he was consecrated and he had no claims on self. We're doing okay today. David had given the Lord his whole heart. I thought about the, the whole heart. And I, I mentioned earlier that people have a heart problem today because they're half in and half out. They're not completely sold out uh, to the Lord. But the Bible has a lot to say about the whole heart. Did you know something, my friend? Uh, David was following in the pattern of the Mosaic law in Deuteronomy chapter 6 uh, and verse 5 when he said, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Uh, uh, there Moses in his writing said, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God, what? With all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Hey, listen, that was God's commandment. That was Moses' writing. David was following in the example of Moses. And my friend, the whole heart. When we speak of the heart today, it's like the word love. We throw that around very loosely, don't we? And we've let the world define what love and the heart means. But God defines what that is in the Bible. And my friend, uh, uh, we have, the Bible has a, a lot to say about the whole heart. Did you know that loving God with, with your whole heart is not just an emotional feeling? It's not simply just uh, uh, ascribing to God the, the attributes of your affection. But my friend, it's earnestly seeking God uh, and abandoning all other things that you might serve Him and no one else. And the Bible has a lot to say about the whole heart. David, in, a, in another writing in Psalms, uh, uh, tells us that uh, our, our earnest, uh, earnestly seeking the Lord with the whole heart requires obedience. You can't serve God with your whole heart and not be obedient. Uh, hey, listen. Uh, hey, listen. Uh, and, and there in Psalm chapter 119 and verse number 2, he said, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek after him 
with the whole heart. Uh, hey, listen, you can't separate obedience uh, and the whole heart. Uh, did you know something? If, if you're going to give God your whole heart, uh, you're going to have to trust in Him. I think sometimes we have contingency plans. We have backup plans, just in case plans. Hey, listen, my friend, but we must trust in the Lord. The Lord knows what he is doing. And there in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, the son of David, Solomon, has this to say. He said, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. You can't give God your whole heart and not trust in Him. Oh, listen. If I, hey, if you're going to trust in the Lord, it's going to require... If you're going to give God your whole heart, it's going to require some prayer. It's going to require dedication and prayer. In fact, we Jeremiah the prophet spoke about this in chapter 29 and verse 13 uh, when he said, And ye shall see me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Hey, listen, what were they doing? They were seeking God. What do we do when we pray to God? We're seeking God. In prayer, we're speaking to God. We're, we're searching God. We're, we're seeking after God. And if we're going to give God our whole heart, we must seek after Him. I wonder today what people are seeking after. Oh, listen, not only that, and I'll give you one last thought today. If you're going to give God your whole heart, it's going to involve some repentance. You've got to turn from yourself and turn to the Lord. You're going, to, you're going to have to have a different mind and a different attitude about sin. And you're going to have to see things as God sees them. And I thought about the prophet Joel, that minor prophet there in chapter 2, where he said, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart. Did you notice something in every, every verse I read you this morning? There's no place where it's halfway no place where it's partial. No place where the Lord gives us and says, just do the best you can. In every place we're told to seek God with all thine heart. And David here in this, in, this, in, this, uh, in this personal revival in the time of trouble. And David here lets us know that the position of revival is a matter of the heart. Uh, he said, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. In verse 2 he says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness, for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Hey, listen, David was submitting. He, he was surrendering to the Lord. He was worshiping toward the holy temple. He was praising the name of the Lord. And I thought about that passage of scripture there where he says, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Did you know something that we're identified by our name? I, I, I mean, when, when I say Brother Kenneth, or I say Brother Jerry, or Brother David, or Brother Andy, I, I, I mean, in our name we're ascribing all that encompasses who we are. When I say Brother Kenneth, I, I, I'm immediately invoking everything that Kenneth is. I, I mean, all of his characteristics and his attributes, uh, his loves and dislikes and what he's known for, uh, and all that is about him. And the Lord here says uh, that he has magnified thy word above all thy name. God is saying uh, above all that even I am and that you know me to be. He said, I want more than all other for you to be obedient. To my word, what I have to say is magnified above all else. My friend, I think sometimes we're good at giving lip service to the Lord and saying the things we think we ought to say. But saying and doing are two different things. And the position of revival is a matter of the heart. It's selling out to God and giving God all. It, it's worshiping and praising Him. It's getting at the feet of our Savior and in obedience and submission. David had given it all today. Are we doing okay today? 
This is the position of revival. I want revival. Do you want revival? I want to see God move in my life and in my family's life. I, I'm fearful for what my grandchildren face. And, and, I, and, my, and my nine grandchildren, I have the some of them at the house about every day and they're up around my feet. And I, I know that won't last forever and they'll grow up and they'll go off on their own, my friend. But my friend, I'm fearful for what they'll face in the days to come. I thought about this and I anticipated your thoughts and mine when I talked about the position of revival because I'm sure that there'll be someone that'll say in their heart, but preacher, you don't understand what I'm going through. Preacher, you don't understand the difficulty that I face. And preacher, you don't know what it's like at my home and you're right, I, I, I don't know and I probably can't understand. But I can assure you, my friend, that no matter what you're going through, you can have revival with God in the time of trouble. And David was doing just that. And the first thing that we see in David's life was the position that he was in. And then I see not only the, the position of revival, but I see the place of revival. You know, some people think that revival is simply a mountaintop experience. Some people think that revival is ice cream and cake Christianity. Uh, and some people believe that revival is something that happens at the church house or, or in a prayer meeting or some type of religious gathering. Uh, but the Lord shows up and we can experience and have revival in the time of trouble. The place of revival, did you notice here in verse 7? He said, though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. In David's place, the place of revival, the place... You know, there's just something about trouble that causes us to seek God, isn't there? I, I, it's just, it's our human nature. I, it ought not to be like that. We, we ought to seek God when the sun's is shining the same way when the sun's not shining. But there's a tendency in our human DNA and our nature that it seems like that troubles and trials bring us to a place often where we must seek God. And David here was seeking God in the time of trouble. He, had, he, was, he was turning to the Lord. Uh, he, he, had, he had got on his knees. He was seeking the Lord. And, and, uh, and uh, I noticed something about the place of revival though. It's easy to see. It's easy to understand that the place of revival in the time of trouble. But there's something, uh, there's something in that that's maybe a little bit less known. Did you look with me in verse 6? He said, though the Lord be high, and he is high, he's above all things. He's the God of heaven. He's, he's ruler of all things. He said, though the Lord be high, yet he hath respect unto the lowly. Oh my goodness, he says, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Oh, listen, I, hey, listen, I, I, I mean, this place of revival, this time of trouble is among the lowly and not the proud. And I thought about this as I was studying this. Some of the sweetest people I ever met, and some people that were filled with humility and love, oftentimes had suffered the greatest afflictions in life. They had went and endured the things of life that nobody else had endured. And, and oftentimes they were poor and uh, raised under hard circumstances, my friend. Uh, hey, but listen, God resisteth the proud uh, and giveth grace to the humble. Uh, if we're going to have revival to God, uh, if we're going to have, we're going to be stirred, uh, moved to a closer walk with the Lord, we're going to have to abandon self and turn to the Lord. It requires humility to do that. We must humble ourselves before the Lord. I thought about this as well. I think sometimes that we that we we think of humility as just simply a gentle demeanor. You know, some people are soft spoken. They're very humble in their nature. They they're they're not assuming. They they're not forward. And they're 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 shy in their uh, in their approach, and they they don't promote self. But that in and of itself may not be humility, my friend. But you know what humility is? It's the absence of self, and it's the presence of the Lord. I see this place of revival or the position of revival. It's a matter of the heart. 
I see the place of revival in the, in the midst of trouble. It, God, God gives grace to the humble. He, 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 but the proud he knoweth afar off. And then I see the power of revival. You know what David said? Are we doing okay this morning? Verse 8. He said, The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. I notice in verse 8 that he said, Forsake not the works of thine own hands. In verse 7, he says, Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies. He says, Thy right hand shall save me. Again, in verse 8, he says, thy, The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. He said, Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. You know what David was saying? That there's power in revival. That God has the ability to deliver. I, I mean, his right hand was significant. or it signified his power. It, it demonstrated God's ability. My friend, God's able to do all things. I, hey, listen, I, I, there's not a prayer that confounds him. There's not an event on earth that confuses him. I, I, there's not anything that takes him by surprise. He's got all power in heaven and earth. I, and whatever it is that you face in this life, I, I, whether it's of your own making or somebody else's. You can have revival in, time, in the time of trouble and by God's mighty hand delivered by His power and put in a place where you can experience the power of Almighty God.